This is Arthur Gates reporting from Nuremberg for the Combined American Network. I was an eyewitness to the execution of the wilted, spoiled flower of Nazidom, but I only saw ten Nazis die. Wilhelm Hermann Goering, guilty on all four counts, the man whom Justice Jackson described as half militarist and half gangster, escaped his fate of hanging by committing suicide at 10.45 last night Less than three hours before he would have been executed. Goering, the active agent of Hitler, who combined a court of steel and cruelty with a lust of self-adornment and power in a certain affability, the man who only last week broke down and cried when he met his wife, and she told him that his little daughter had said not to worry that she would see him in heaven, that man succeeded in taking cyanide of potassium. However, he did it so cleverly that the sentinel watching him did not even see him put his hand to his mouth. He was first observed as twitching. He was heard to make a strange sound. Then the sentinel called a corporal and entered the cell. When the German, Dr. Fluker, and the chaplain who were on the floor arrived, and with an officer rushed in, they already heard the death rattle. Examination of the room revealed an envelope torn open at the top, marked in pencil simply H. Goering. It contained three penciled notes and a small brass container made from a cartridge case, standard Nazi leader equipment. Examination of Goering revealed bits of glass in his mouth and an odor which to the doctor indicated the pressure or the presence of cyanide of potassium. The same type of container containing a vial of cyanide potassium was taken from the convict Goering on his arrival at Mondorf last May. Then it was found concealed in a can of American Nescafe in his possession. How he obtained it and was able to conceal it after the daily detailed searches to which his cell and he had been subjected has not yet been determined but those people who saw him last must be under suspicion. As a result of Goering's suicide, the remainder of the condemned men whom it had been contemplated to move freely to their execution were manacled. The news of Goering's suicide came to us shortly after midnight, two hours after we had returned from our inspection tour of the prison and the execution site. The eight correspondents representing the world press at about 8.30, began to inspect the prison wing in which the Nazis had spent the longest year of their lives. When we arrived at the right of the four-wing jail, we learned that the condemned had not yet been informed. Caring had already gone to bed. To me, he seemed to be sleeping nonchalantly. What a good act he had put on. All the others were still awake, although Stryker also soon retired. Fritz Salkel was pacing the floor nervously. General Alfred Yodel was writing, possibly a last letter to his wife. They had been exchanging mail daily. General Wilhelm Keitel was fully dressed in his field green uniform, cap in hand. Hans Frank sat there resigned on his bed, contentedly smoking a cigar. Arthur Seitz Inquart was reading. Joachim von Rippentrop was kneeling at his bedside with a Protestant chaplain engaged in earnest prayer. As we left the prison, we crossed another yard, and there in a 33 by 78 foot hall, which until last Sunday had been used by the soldiers for their basketball games, we found the execution chamber. Actually, with its 20 foot high brown stained ceilings, Brightly lighted by ten large globes, it presented a less depressing place than the dimly lighted jail. Up near the farther broad side of the building, three scaffolds were mounted. They were elevated on eight foot high, eight feet square platforms. The traps were hidden from view by black curtains. The five windows in the whitewashed hall had been covered with tar paper. On my recent previous visit to the prison, I had stood within 30 feet of the execution center, completely unaware of its existence. So well was the secret kept 
that until yesterday afternoon, only two members of the security personnel of the prison had known about its whereabouts, workers having been imported to erect the demountable scaffolds. When we heard of Goering's suicide, there was a certain tenderness in all our hearts for Colonel C.B. Andrews. We sensed what he must be feeling over the premature loss of his main charge. The Colonel took it, proceeded then to relate how he carried out the orders of the Allied Control Council. At 11.38, he entered the first cell to read to the condemned according to the text presented by the International Military Tribunal on October 1st when the sentences were passed. I quote the colonel, I have been directed by the Allied Control Council to again read to you your sentence, unquote. Then followed the sentence for each. It was then that the prisoners first knew. Each bowed courteously and submitted to manacling. Stryker first glared at the soldier, but when the colonel stepped in, he turned and said, thank you. Fritz Saukel refused to change his clothes. When the cuffs were locked, he screamed, I pay my respects to American officers and American soldiers, but not to American justice. There were no other incidents. In the intervening more than an hour still allowed each man to live, he was fed his last meal. Earlier, we had seen the preparation, canned pork, tomato and potato salad, pancakes, and coffee. Just before one o'clock in the morning, our correspondent group, accompanied by Dr. Wilhelm Hegner, Minister President of Bavaria, and Dr. Jakob Leisner, General Prosecutor of the High Court at Nuremberg, was led back into the execution chamber to join a group of 30 others, including the four-man Allied Commission, the American General Roy B. Rickard, the British Brigadier Patton Walsh, and the French and Russian Generals Morel and Molko. Only military men were present. There was a silent, serious atmosphere, although the well-lighted room gave no air of morbidity. For the correspondent, eight tables had been provided facing the three scaffolds, only two of which were to be used. This was no exhibition. We were there to make the record. It was all a precise, business-like, impersonal operation one that had needed doing so badly after such terror and aggression. Out of their own mouths and their own records, these men had been judged and found guilty. It was just seven minutes after one o'clock, European time, when the American Sergeant Wood and his assistant mounted the first platform and took up their positions with rope and hood. Orders were sent back to the prison to bring in Germany's once aggressive, vociferous foreign minister Joachim von Rippentrop from cell seven. He was guilty on four counts of conspiracy, crimes against the peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. It was 1.11 when the pale, exhausted, slightly disheveled, brown-suited 53-year-old worshiper of the Führer stood at the door was uncuffed, led to the foot of the stairs where his hands were bound. Upon request, he repeated his name. Slowly, the 13 stairs were mounted. Rippentrop responded strangely to the permission given to make a last statement. He spoke intently, and I quote, God protect Germany. God have mercy on my soul. My last wish is that German unity be maintained, that understanding between East and West be realized, and there be peace for the world." End of quote. This man had sown intrigue and sought to set East and West against each other for Germany's benefit. He seemed to sense the error of his way. Then came the hood, the trap, and von Rippentrop died at 1.29, 15 minutes later. Already the green-clad, ashen-gray, 62-year-old Wilhelm Keitel, chief of the high command of the armed forces, guilty on all four counts, had been brought in with escort of three military men and Protestant chaplains. 
This man was to die because the world no longer wanted the doctrine of superior orders absolving a soldier from crime. The court had said that even to a soldier, superior orders could not be considered in mitigation where crimes as shocking and extensive had been committed consciously, ruthlessly, and without military excuse or justification. Germany's top man at arms spoke as a Prussian soldier, quote, I call on the Almighty to be considered of the German people, provide tenderness and mercy. Over two million German soldiers went to their death for their fatherland before me. I now follow my sons, all for Germany, and I thank you. Unquote. The trap was sprung on scaffold number two at 119, and death came at 133. Appearing sleepily disturbed, pale, with dueling scars very much in evidence, 43-year-old Dr. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, Grand Inquisitor and successor to Heydrich, climbed the stairs and made his last pronouncement. Quote, I served the German people and my fatherland with willing heart. I did my duty according to its laws. I am sorry that in her trying hour she was not led only by soldiers. I regret that crimes were committed in which I had no part. Good luck, Germany. The trap was sprung at 1.38, and 11 minutes later, Kalten Brunner was pronounced dead. He had been found guilty on the third and fourth counts, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Compared with his reign of death and murder, Torquemada had been an amateur. Dispirited and lifeless was the appearance of 53-year-old Alfred Rosenberg, Nazi philosopher and high priest of the master race, first fashioner of foreign policy for the Nazi party. He was guilty on all counts. From him there were no last words. He only cleared his throat. He wanted no prayers, and the chaplain merely stood by. The trap was sprung only a minute after he entered the room at 1.47 and a half, and 13 minutes later he was carted off to a nameless grave. A penitent soul, with a smile on his face, entered the room as guards brought in the bound Hans Frank, once uncrowned king of Poland, who had tried to establish a new order of authority without law so that the will of the Nazi party would be the only test of legality. He climbed the stairs, followed by the Catholic Franciscan father. In Krakow in Poland several months ago, Cardinal Zapieha, who had much to do with him during the occupation, told me that Frank had found religion four years too late. With the 46-year-old Frank guilty on counts three and four, he had been forced to admit a terrible guilt within himself that a thousand years would pass before the guilt from Germany would be erased. This morning, the smile never left his face until the hood covered it. Before Frank quietly remarked, I am thankful for the kind treatment which I received during this incarceration, and I pray God to receive me mercifully. Eleven and a half minutes later, at 2.08 and a half, the former president of the Academy of German Law was dead. Wearing the same sport coat we had seen every day in the courtroom, with a bewildered, puzzled interest, Dr. Wilhelm Frick, the man who had made Hitler a German, was brought into the chamber. The closely cropped, one-time Nazi minister had been replaced by the more cruel Himmler when his hand was no longer brutal enough. He continued his nefarious activities in Czechoslovakia. It was his pen which signed the Nuremberg Decrees, which led to complete disenfranchisement and almost complete extermination of the Jews. His mercy killings of useless eaters had brought death to at least 275,000 innocent souls. Two, three, and four, he only spoke one line. Let live the eternal Germany. He was dead at 219, 12 minutes after the trap was sprung. We all expected that sometime during the procedure, the shout Heil Hitler would ring out. The only Nazi who had previously done time in this Nuremberg jail for slandering the local mayor, wild-eyed Jubater Julius Streicher, bellowed out that greeting 
and followed it as he climbed the 13 stairs with the words, Now I go to God. Purim Festival 1946, and now to God. The Bolsheviks will once hang you. I am now by God, my father. And even as the hood was being fastened, he shouted, Adele, my dear wife. Stryker, one of the most despicable characters in German history, found guilty on count four because of his smear sheet, the Stürmer, took death with difficulty. This bald, shunned, one-time Gauleiter of Franconia, whom even his own colleagues could not stand, spewed poison at the German people, which millions of them lapped up to be driven into orgies of impassioned desire to exterminate the Jews. Stryker was dead at 2.28, 12 and a half minutes after the trap was sprung. From previous observations, it was thought generally around here that 52-year-old Fritz Sauckel, brutish little man, guilty on counts three and four, so typical of the herd of followers produced in the Third Reich, would have to be carried in. But he had pulled himself together. Possibly the death of Goering had supplied the backbone. He spat out the name Fritz Sauckel when it was asked. And then on the trap, he shouted, I die innocently. The verdict was wrong. God protect Germany and make Germany great again. Let Germany live and God protect my family. The cruelest slaver since the pharaohs, the man whose own record showed that out of five million workers, only 200,000 of them came to Germany of their own free will, did show courage in death. There were no cowards among these men. That's why they were so dangerous, so ruthless, why they almost succeeded in drawing all of Europe into their net. Sauckel died at 239, 13 minutes after the trap was sprung. With turned up collar, bald 56-year-old Alfred Yodel showed flushed face and red eyes as he entered the execution chamber and was led to the scaffold. Militarists had been proud of their profession, but the man who stepped on the trap at 234 had been declared a disgrace. The court maintained that crimes alleged and partly admitted by him had never been required of any soldier, and he could not shield himself behind a mythical requirement of soldierly obedience at all costs for commission of these crimes. With the words, I salute you, my Germany, Yodel went to his death at 250. Arthur Seiss Inquart, spearhead of the Austrian Fifth Column, who took over the government of his own country only to make a present of it to Hitler, who then helped bring misery to Poland and the Netherlands, made his quiet entrance and provided climax to this chapter in German retribution. Before he died and his glasses had been removed for the hood, the green-clad, once brilliant attorney stated, I quote, I hope that this execution is the last act of the tragedy of the Second World War and that a lesson will be learned so that peace and understanding will be realized among the nation. I believe in Germany, unquote. Seisinkwart died at 2.57, just ten minutes after the trap was sprung and less than two hours after von Rippentrop had first entered the room. Ten men had died here and the body of the other Hermann Wilhelm Goering was brought in at the end to complete the picture. One Martin Bormann did not answer the call. Either he received his just desserts in the final struggle for Berlin, or vermin-like, he has crept away, hoping for another dark night in Germany. This has been a significant day in world history. To eight correspondents, it was a harrowing, difficult assignment to watch these men die. That they died after a trial in which they were given every opportunity to defend themselves, a test to the determination of their accusers to put their acts on record as violation of law. The court has said that aggressive war is an international crime. And what is more, individuals can be punished for violations of international law for such crimes are always committed by men and not by abstract entities and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced this happened in nuremberg in the words of the bavarian minister president dr hagener who witnessed the executions justice has been done. This is Arthur Gates reporting from Nuremberg 
for the combined American networks. I return you now to the United States. 